Is Libya a failed state? Rallies have been held for and against the new parliament after Islamic groups were rejected at the ballot box. But as the UN tries to broker a deal, what does it take to bring Libyans together? Or is international intervention the answer to Libya's turmoil? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome. You're with Inside Story. I'm Martine Dennis and today we're focusing on the rapidly fragmenting state of Libya. The country has been torn by feuds between rival militia who are waging war in the streets. Three years after the fall of Gaddafi, the country is on the brink of collapse and the Libyan people have had enough. Demonstrations have been taking place across the country. Some have marched in support of the new parliament Others have turned out in their thousands to show their disgust at their newly elected leaders. Well, even the country's main international airport in the capital, Tripoli, has become a casualty. Aircraft have been destroyed as rival militia try to take control. They've also destroyed several oil depots here and elsewhere. Some oil ports in the west of the country remain in rebel hands. Well, the current round of violence is largely between two broad groups and their affiliates. On one hand, you've got nationalist forces from the town of Zintan who are loyal to the retired General Khalifa Haftar. On the other hand, you've got tribal forces from the city of Misrata. Well, the Zintanis claim the Misratan militias are Islamists, whilst the Misratans claim the Zintanis a remnants of the old Gaddafi regime, each side insisting that they are Libya's true national army. Okay, let's bring in our guests now from Beirut, Anas Al Gomati, who's director of the Tripoli based Sadak Institute, and from Paris, Elon Ravin, who's a journalist and author of a book on Muammar Gaddafi. And uh, joining us from Skype from Cambridge in the United Kingdom, George Joffe, Professor at the University of Cambridge. And uh, can I start with you, Professor Joffe, George? Um, the question we posed at the top of the programme is, is Libya now a failed state? What would you say to that? I think I'd say no, although it's coming close to becoming one. That's to say that Libyans themselves are determined that the state should not fail. There's evidence that the state is beginning to reform itself despite all the insecurity and despite the conflict that's going on now. Don't forget, there have just been legislative elections. There's a new parliament in being, even though there's a quarrel about its legitimacy. There'll soon be a new government. And the real issue is whether that government and the parliament can find the forces they require to be able to impose their own authority on the state. And then quite apart from that, in large parts of Libya, things are beginning slowly to improve. Even in Misrata, for example, or in Benghazi itself, there's investment going in. There's a new sense that there is a possibility of reconstructing the country. Municipal elections have been held in several cities. So it's not all doom and gloom, although I agree at the moment, it looks very bad indeed. Indeed, uh, Anas al um it does look very bad, particularly from the perspective of, of Tripoli, where we've got fires burning. We've got a, a pretty much uh, eviscerated international airport. Uh, tell us who is fighting whom and what they're fighting for, if you can, uh, in, in brief terms. Well, I guess it depends when, you, when your clock starts ticking. But I think in the, the latest conflict is, um, you know, it still employs this revolutionary narrative, as you alluded to earlier on. However, it does have an added component now that there is a degree of realism in Libya that has never really been uh, there, just on the table. And I think that's that, that started around May 15th um, with Colonel Khalifa Haftar's um, Operation Dignity, his war on terror. Uh, and now in true Libyan irony, uh, we have Operation Dawn uh, from Misrata's uh, forces, which is a counter war on terror. And so you have two competing narratives. Each of them employ a, you know, a pejorative term, terrorism, and, the, and you know, only three years ago we were using an idealistic term, revolution. Now, trying to uncover what these really mean would just be quite simple if it meant you know, finding consensus among six, six million people, which is an, you know, an impossibility. However, when it comes towards militias, they are fighting for you know, competing financial and military interests. 
Uh, and that has always been the case. I think nobody fights for ideology anymore. It's very, very difficult to look for anywhere in Libya that does fight for ideology. However, there are always going to be four lines amongst which militias or tribes or even, you know, uh, urbanized centers are going to fight for, which is identity. Um, you know, whether it's a, a you know, minority tribe uh, with an ethnic difference or um, in the south, like the Tebo or the Tuareg, whether it's the, uh, uh, or the, or the federalists in the east of the country in Cyrenaica, uh, whether it's the economy uh, and those that are fighting for a, a, a more of a share in New Libya and for marginalized from beforehand. Uh, that could be Zintan, that could also be Masata. Uh, when it looks at the, uh, the power dynamics and, and, and those that have, you know, uh, have a uh, disproportionate amount of power in the security apparatus or in the government, uh, and that could be the Islamists or the, or the National Forces Alliance, nobody really knows. Uh, and then you look at the security, and that's whether or not people are facing an existential th uh, crisis, whether or not a neighboring tribe or a neighboring region, uh, whether it's Warfella and Misrata, or whether it's Sintan and a smaller uh, mountainous region, a mountainous town, for example, that are fighting over existential realities, whether or not they're going to be here tomorrow or the day after, that, uh, for that matter. Uh, those things, you know, and, and in any, any democracy or any kind of uh, country that's trying to transition to democracy, it's very hard to find consensus along those lines. But... In reality, when you have a war of this kind of uh, of this kind of sort, you're going to have a national conversation of sorts. All these bullets that are flying, unfortunately, are voicing the message of millions. And, and you know, in that respect, it's very, very difficult to try to ascertain who's fighting over an economic reality, who's fighting over a, a revolutionary narrative. So in this case, it's kind of chaos. But there are solutions going forward. And then to make a very final point about this uh, notion of whether or not Libya is a failed state, I think Libya is an inherently weak state. When we ask about whether or not it's got, you know, the, the ability to have uh, you know, full territorial sovereignty, uh, you know, full rights over its territory. I, th I don't think it's ever had that kind of that, that, that reality. Whether or not we ask about legitimate security apparatus, has it ever had that? So I think in, in some respects, and, and you know, mountain refugee crisis, which has always had, I think in some respects, Libya has always been an inherently weak state. And the only way to come back to a, you know, a less than failing state or a burgeoning state would in fact have to adopt some kind of authoritative uh, policies that they were, they were enacted in the last 42 years under Gaddafi. So I think in that respect, it's very, very difficult to ascertain what we mean by a failed state. Libya may in, you know, may in fact remain forever as an inherently weak state, but there are some ways, as George alluded to, there are some ways of reversing this case. And I think to a certain degree, the case of legitimacy is a self-fulfilling prophecy. As long as six million people will, or at least the two million that go to the ballot box, believe in the reality that there is a currency there called legitimacy, it moves from one camp to another camp. As long as it doesn't disappear, you know, Libya still has some chances. Um, can I come to you, Hélène, in, in Paris? Because, of course, France was at the vanguard of the NATO airstrikes of 2011 that helped to finally get rid of uh, Colonel Gaddafi. Is France willing now to intervene to try to help Libyans re-establish uh, some form of order and indeed to start building the institutions? Yes, it's, um, you know, the, the militia was uh, the beginning of militia is uh, begin a st a start uh, during the embargo. Some militia was uh, created during this, uh, this period. And uh, jihadists uh, were in the society in Libya during, uh, the, during the era of Gaddafi. And now all these elements uh, explode. And they, they, take, they are taking uh, bigger, bigger importance uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya. And uh, the, the militia are composed uh, some uh, some young people, uh, of young people without uh, employment, without a job, and they prefer to uh, to be in the traffic and uh, to 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 buy and sell the arms uh, instead of uh, working in. Uh, in uh, in industries, companies, industries, and yes, it's a but, big, but big would, problem. But and will France uh, and intervene, does it to, uh, And now, would France be prepared to intervene? Yes, and uh, uh, it's very difficult for now for Western to uh, to intervene now again in uh, in Libya because uh, uh, how to to intervene? There 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 are some problems in the south of uh, of uh, of Libya. There is now in the in the east and uh, now in the in the west, and uh, it's very very difficult to to fight. USA tried to uh, to do something in Libya. They sent uh, uh, some uh, special forces to to fight uh, uh, jihadists, uh, and uh, sometimes they, they, ca they catch they can catch uh, some uh, one one jihadist, 
uh, but is not uh, is not enough. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the Western uh, under estimated the different elements of, uh, of this uh, society, uh, the jihadists uh, and the, the, the militia. And uh, the difficulties now is to, to find uh, the means to, to, in, to, to intervene now and how. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the, the Libyans are not really agree to, uh, to see another intervention in, uh, in Libya. Uh, for example, uh, Abdel Hakim Belaj don't want an, uh, an intervention in, uh, in Libya. And uh, the, uh, the first prime minister would like to, uh, to uh, would like uh, Western to, to uh, intervene okay, in Libya. Okay, Ellen, but let, how? Let's, let's come how? back, let's come uh, back to the international, uh, let's come back to the international perspective. And George, um, can I um, just explore a little bit more um, the situation on the ground in Libya today? Because, I mean, who's in control? It seems very much as though we have these competing uh, militias, uh, tribes, uh, with, yes. with various competing interests. And George, yes. um, help us to understand why the government, the newly elected House of Representatives, is actually paying for these militias allowing the militias to call themselves a, a security force for the country? Well, if you go back a year and a half, there was a problem. And the problem was, what were you going to do about the militias? There were 350 of them at least. And the question was also, how would you guarantee security for the population? So the government took what may prove to have been a fateful step of deciding that it would try to recruit the militias on its own side, and it would guarantee them payment. What actually it did was thereby to endorse the militias and their own independent chains of command and their own independent political agendas. So what ended up was that the government found itself paying for militias who had quite different agendas from the government itself. And that's been the situation that's continued. And what we're now seeing is a series of different conflicts playing themselves out. And they're quite complex. On the one hand, in Tripoli, you've got two major militias, Zintan and Misrata, who represent different political currents, as you heard earlier, who are now struggling between themselves to demonstrate they dominate the situation inside Tripoli. Then there's a subsidiary faction, and that is in the west of the country, around Zawiya, where there is a tribal militia that was accused of being a supporter of the Gaddafi regime, battling it out with the Zawiya militia, but that also reflects the tensions inside Tripoli. If you then travel eastwards, in Benghazi, there's a quite different situation. On the one hand, there's a very strong separatist movement that's developed there over the last two years. And that, in part, is responsible for the blocking of oil uh, exports in Libya. And alongside that, there is a movement, Operation Dignity, which is designed to undermine the more extremist Islamist militias there. And that's organized by General uh, Khalifa Haftar. Now, he's not been very successful, but he's been successful enough to cause a real tension inside Benghazi. And then in the south, there's an even further problem in that the border regions are controlled by militias from the Fazan. And they become in involved and integrated into the smuggling networks of the Sahara, particularly the new arms smuggling networks that are being fed by the enormous dumps of weapons that were left from the Gaddafi regime. Now, given that, you've got an enormously complex problem for any government to deal with. And the government itself has not had the power to be able to do so. There is a new Libyan army in formation. It's being trained in the United States, in Britain, in Turkey and in Italy. But it's not ready and there's no command structure for it. So the government really has got no force available to it. That's why the Athene government actually proposed there should be foreign intervention. But as you've heard, that's going to be extremely unpopular in Libya. Libyans don't want that, even though they are fed up with the lack of security that they face. And in those circumstances, it's very difficult to see how any foreign state could intervene, or even the United Nations. All right, uh, Hélène, we'll come to you in a minute. But first of all, let's just have a look uh, a little bit more about the, the fears in the surrounding uh, countries, in the region, and indeed uh, further uh, afield, because there are fears, of course, about the situation in Libya overspilling into other countries. Tunisia... Uh, obviously shares uh, a border with Libya, and we've seen scenes, haven't we, of late, of, of people rushing across the border into Tunisia. 
Now, as George was uh, mentioning, the uh, weapons caches that have been found all over the country, they've been unearthed by all sorts of people and they've ended up in some very uh, peculiar places, some of them ending up in the hands of Al-Qaeda-linked groups in, in northern Mali, for instance. And then again, in Egypt, pressure is growing there on President Sisi to try to contain the situation uh, to his west in case and indeed before it spills in to Egypt. And so, Hélène, um, you, were, you were saying that um, it is a very complex problem uh, and, and, uh, and the French government probably doesn't know where yes, to start. I wanted to say that uh, first, the, the government, uh, uh, Mustafa Abdejali, gave the responsibility of security of militia, for, uh, for uh, uh, particularly to uh, Abdel Hakim uh, Belaj. And the other militia wanted to, to have a look on the buildings too. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, the, the Polition, Libyan Polition must stop to play with militia too. Anas, Anas now, I can see, uh, I can you, see you shaking you your head. Uh, can we just bring in Anas al Gomati in Beirut? Yeah, You're shaking your head at what Hélène is saying. I'm just, I'm just perplexed as to why we keep investing ourselves yes, in personality I'm politics. Abdel Hakim Al Haj is no longer involved you know, in day to day government. He's, he's left the Tripoli Military Council two, year, two and a half years ago, I think. In that respect, I think what we've, what we've been, the biggest failure we've had here is that the international community, number one, is, has been hollow in its conditionality with Libya. You know, Anybody that goes over to the, you know, and, and that's the biggest problem as to why they can't intervene, because whose side do you take in a, in, a, in a battle like this? If you don't have a principled stand, if none of the sides, and you can't agree with any of the sides there to assess, if Abdul Hakim al Haj came back and said, I believe in civic participation, I believe in the, you know, the, the, uh, the rule of law, I believe in the, uh, in the freedom of political participation, you know, I believe in a secular state, what would he then say? You know, who are we going to go inside with? Well, he's an Islamist, so we can't work with him. If you, if you end up trying to divide countries like this, and the, and the problem that Libya's had now is that most of the, most of the uh, protests, you know, they're, yes. they're, they, t they typify one thing and they reflect one thing, a massive sense of frustration. They're not actually voicing any programs. They're voicing slogans, we need a democracy, we need to have, you know, the rule of law. They don't know how to get there. And the point of the international community, their role is to help them get there by providing programs, but also by having a principled stand. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're seen to be speaking to any of those armed, armed groups, whether it's Misato or Zintan, the first thing you've done is you give them the credibility and you give them the legitimacy that they want. That currency is so vital in Libya. However, you know, if you don't have basic stick and carrot diplomacy that every carrot, which is you know, the, 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 the legitimacy that you're giving them, you don't have a stick in place, you don't put them under economic sanctions, you don't, you know, you, you don't actually have anything above your head in the way in which we had in, you know, okay. in uh, NATO's intervention okay. in 2011. Ellen, can, I put that, can I put that then back to you? Um, yes, An yes An I wanted, Anas is, I wanted Anas to say, say, I wanted that to say that one thing. The West thing. and Paris, uh, particularly uh, the government of... Uh, uh, Mr. Hollande, they don't know where to begin, and and yet Francois Hollande has been fairly quick off the mark when it comes to sending in French troops into Mali, uh, into CAR, and indeed hosting a summit about the violence in Nigeria. Why is he so wrong-footed on the situation in Libya? You know, because uh, Libya is very complex, and uh, and uh, I think that uh, France. Uh, need to consult international uh, community to see how to uh, to do with this problem and uh, surrounded uh, countries are concerned too by by this problem uh, about uh, jih jihadist and uh, i think that uh, community international international community must uh, gather to to see how to manage uh, this country uh, the, this problem and because the jihadist uh, it's a problem which uh, concern all uh, other countries of uh, uh, of the region and uh, but the, the fight against uh, jihadists is very very difficult in Mali, it's very difficult. It was very difficult and is yet difficult. And now in, in Libya, uh, it will be very difficult to fight the jihadists. Uh, in the East, uh, after tried to, to fight uh, them, but he has uh, some difficulties on the ground because uh, uh, jihadists came, came, uh, come from uh, Syria too, and uh, they, they help uh, Libyan uh, jihadists in, uh, on the ground. And um, it's very, very difficult okay, to fight Okay, okay. George, can I come, uh, but can I I come like to, to can say? I would like to say okay, one thing. Point. I would like to think. I would like to, to say one thing about the militia. You know, uh, if Misrata 
is now in Tripoli is because uh, the, the president of parliament, Abu Semin, call, called this militia to reinforce uh, Tripoli uh, close to uh, Islamist uh, militia. And it's not too good for the politician, politician Libyan to play this, uh, to play with uh, militia. Of course, um, uh, the army and police uh, can't play, can't play the, the rule of security or bad security. But it's not the rule of a politician Libya to uh, to call uh, a militia to come to the to autumn. Because Misrata, Misrata, mil, the militia of Misrata uh, killed the people in November. In November, and uh, it's not good for population for population uh, to to call every time uh, each time militia to to, okay. to help uh, to right. secure now, the the, we, the town. We're running. We're, we're running out of time, error, Ellen. Um, big, and so, so I'd like. I'd like to ask each of yes. you um, uh, your very brief thoughts on uh, a, a closing issue, and that is um, the acting Prime Minister, Abdallah Al-Thini, uh, speaking at the US-Africa summit in Washington just last week, um, appealed for international support to help get Libya on its feet, but also described this moment as a crossroads. George, can I put it to you first then? Um, what do you think he means, if indeed um, it's, a, it's a question of, of, of success or failure as a state, uh, or what do you think the, the acting Prime Minister was referring to? Well, of course, he won't be prime minister for very long as what a new the, government will be coming along. But, but beyond that, it, the real question is he asked for support. He didn't ask for intervention. And he knows perfectly well that intervention would be a disaster. I also have to point out that countries like France and Britain, which were involved in the whole question of regime change in Libya, thought they would get away very easily without really becoming involved. And they've now learned to the cost of Libyans that that was completely wrong. So there is a major problem. Actually, no one really knows what to do. And what really needs to be done is what the United Nations is trying to do. That's to promote some kind of reconciliation through the national dialogue, some kind of contact through the process of institution building, some kind of security under government control. All those are the things that need to be done. And I think in some respects, the current crisis, violent though it is, could represent the last throw. The militias know that in the end, the House of Representatives is going to cut off the funding to them. They know that if they don't impose themselves now, they won't be able to do so in future. They know that the whole question of Operation Dignity is an indication of the frustration of the Libyan people with what's been going on, the way in which they reject the militias. So in a sense, therefore, there's a possibility now that with genuine external support, through the United Nations, not by individual states, it might be possible to begin to rebuild the situation in Libya and control the militias which are at the root of the insecurity and the violence. Anas, can I ask you, as a Libyan, OK, you're not talking from Libya right now, you're in, you're in Beirut, but as a Libyan, how does this moment uh, appear to you? How do you assess this particular moment that the acting prime minister has described as a crossroads for your country? Well, I, I think we're at this, uh, at this point where we could descend into a chaos and, a, in fact, a, an economic situation that is irreversible. You know, Libya's vast assets are going down the drain, literally, and being burnt away, literally, uh, in the past week. And I think in that respect, we are at a crossroads where we need international intervention. But I think the intervention that I, I would actually ask for is uh, to have the kind of UN missions that a lot of uh, post-conflict countries in Africa had uh, that were bolstered by their abilities to have institutional arrangements, sunset clauses, peace agreements. Those are the kind of vital things that are actually you know, that electoral democracy doesn't actually really solve. Electoral and ballot box democracy, in some cases, causes more problems than it, than it gives answers. And I think off the table, you need to have the kind of institutional arrangements that can really underpin and then immunize the political game so that, you know, the House of Representatives can do its job and the security service can be an apolitical, genuine servant of the state. And I think in that respect, that's where we need to be, but we're definitely not there yet. Anas al Gomati of the Sadek Institute, talking to us live from Beirut, but himself a Libyan political analyst. So I thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Ellen Brava, uh, writer with the National De Defence Review, talking to us live from Paris. Thank you very much. And indeed, Professor George Joffe, thank you. Thank uh, you. Talking to us live from Cambridge. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can always leave your comments on facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story, or you can go to 
at AJ Inside Story on Twitter. I'm Martine Dennis. Goodbye for now.